Yeah, that's what it was. That's what it was. I'm sorry. That's all I can touch. Okay. Thank you. 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 Okay, hello everyone, good afternoon. If we could get started, because we're already running slightly um, behind, just five minutes breaks are killing me. So I'll, without further ado, I'll hand it over to you. Hi everyone, welcome. Um, thank you for coming to our session today. Um, my colleague, Stacey Katz, didn't be here, um, but she's with us in spirit. Um, so um, today I want to share, um, Stacey and I work together to uh, guest edit a special issue of the Journal for Multicultural Education. Um, so that's what I'm going to be talking about. And if you're interested in reading the articles that are in the special issue, use that QR code right there um, in, the um, in order to access it. Um, and I have the link again um, closer to the end of the presentation. Or if you're online, you can uh, use that URL. Um, it is open access. So. Mm -mm. Oh, down. Okay, there we go. All right. So um, our goal, this started uh, a long time ago, in 2020, actually. Um, my my colleague and I, Stacey, we co-authored uh, a publication, Teaching with OER During T Pandemics and Beyond, for the Journal of Multicultural Education. Um, we were approached by our colleague, who is the editor of the, um, of the journal, and she said, hey, there's not been a lot on this in our journal. Would you be interested in writing something? Because though we are during the pandemic, it would be a great resource for teachers and for educators all over the place. Um, so we wrote one and it was really well received. Um, we were both members of the um, uh, OER Research Fellows group um, and were able to make that publication open access through um, the funding by Hewlett Foundation with the, with the fellowship. Um, and so since that was so well received, the editor came back to us and said, hey, how about we do a special issue on this? And that's where we came to a problem, because Emerald is the publisher of the Journal for Multicultural Education, and it is not an open access journal. And our core beliefs here are we need this to be open. We want this to be made fully available to everybody. Um, but we were both untenured. Um, <laughs> faculty at the time, um, and publisher Paris, right? So it's this dichotomy, what are we gonna do? Um, so we uh, approached the Hewlett Foundation, since they had so generously um, provided the, um, the, the fee for making our article open access. We approached them and said, hey, is this something that would fit in the goals of Hewlett Foundation? And they're like, yeah, absolutely. And we were able to create this entire special issue as an open access piece. Um, so we released the, the CFP, we published the CFP on Twitter and all the listservs, um, and we had a brainstorming sessions at um, Open Ed 21, OE Global 21, and OER Camp. And in those sessions, we shared the CFP, we talked about what is equity pedagogy, how do we see these things intersecting, and what are your ideas? Provided a place for authors, or potential authors, to come together, form collaborations, or just brainstorm and think about, would this work? Um, and those, those were really great sessions, lots and lots of collaboration that happened there. Um, so here's what we ended up with. We ended up with nine articles in total. And this is kind of just the big, broad view. We're going to take a look at three of them. Um, but putting them all together, um, Stacy and I co-wrote Open With Intention, which really um, just provides background. It provides a bit of a historical background on open education, open educational practices, and equity pedagogy, and kind of situates the whole special issue. Um, then the pieces that we got from um, authors really were grouped into three themes. We saw professional development applications. And with this, oh, I should go back. In, in the, um, the, the topic, uh, open educational practices and the intersections with equity pedagogy, what we notice is that there's a lot out there on, oh, here's what open educational practices are. Oh, here's social justice within these practices. But there's not a lot of research out there on specific applications in the classroom. We have ideas about it, but what does it look like? And what have been others' experiences with it? Which is why we thought this is 
we need more on this. And that was our intention with the special issue. So you'll see our authors did just that. They described projects, they described research that they collected um, on open educational practices within equity pedagogy. Um, and equity pedagogy has its roots in multicultural education, which fit the journal really well. Um, but it really takes a bigger, broader look in looking at students, their lived experiences, how their identities, their backgrounds, um, honoring that in the classroom. Fits really well with open educational practices, right? Um, all right, so we had professional development applications. and. We wanted within the special issue to really look at open educational practices from pre-K all the way into higher education. We were really wanted to prioritize K-12. There's just not a lot out there on K-12 and the applications in K-12 tends to be a little bit more tenuous. Whether people don't know that's what they're doing with their students or haven't named it as such or just kind of try to fly under the radar with it. We're not sure why, but there's not a lot out there and you'll see that. Um, but the professional development applications, um, these three articles um, come from a wide range. Most of them are higher ed focused, but which one is it? Um, supporting educators professional learning for pedagogy looks at pre-K or like preschool teachers in Australia, they don't receive a lot of professional development. If you think about like daycare kind of workers in those early childhood ages, um, they are in some of the most formative years of a child's education, yet they're not receiving any training on how to appropriately address equity, especially in Australia with um, the, the reconciliation work that's happening, right? So um, they, in that first one, they were looking at um, how we can use OER to build in some professional development for these preschool, pre early year educators. The second one looks at how to um, create equitable access using, it, it looked at, um, now I forget which one that one is. Yes, I believe that's the one where it took undergraduates who were in teacher preparation programs, created OER, and they collaborated with, um, with practicing teachers, in-service teachers who read through it, said, oh, I found this really helpful. Here's where I see gaps missing. It went back to the undergraduates and they filled in the gaps and then it went back and forth, creating a really unique dialogue between pre-service teachers and in-service teachers. Um, and then the Open for Anti-Racism program is a program for higher education faculty, a PD that they can go into and learn more about how to apply anti-racist practices using OER in their coursework. Um, the next section at classroom applications, we're actually going to, appropriately for this conference, look at, the authors are gonna to speak to us through videos we collected about each of their projects. There was only one, this first one, open learning design for using open educational practices in high school and beyond. Um, Brina Roberts, she's spoken at a lot of sessions here. That's actually her work that she did. And that was the only one that we got that was really focused on K-12 students um, and engaging students in open educational practices at that level. Um, the others looked at the teachers and working with teachers in these practices, not necessarily their students. Um, then who writes and responds, looks at social annotation and open educational practices in a cultural capability unit, looks at um, in another Australian context, working with undergraduate students using open educational practices to do some of that reconciliation work. Um, the last set of articles that we got, the last two, um, these weren't necessarily in practice, but there are ways that we can take what we've learned and apply open educational practices in practice. Um, so the first one looks at how can OER, how OER can support collaborative teacher learning, looks at an open learning guidebook and how small groups of practicing teachers can work together to build their practices for more equitable learning in their classrooms. Um, and it, it doesn't apply it in action, but it gives like a framework for how this could be done. And the last one, designing for resistance, um, takes a theory and 
kind of draws it out, looking at where the edu open ed educational practices fit in, and then they provide some really specific practices that you could take in your classroom and do right away. Um, so we got a lot of really, really rich articles here. All right, so let's learn more about those classroom applications. So these are the three that we're going to look at. The first one, I, I don't think I have them in that order, um, was by Sarah Lambert and Joanna Funk. Um, and this was the one, the cultural capability unit, learning at the cultural interface. So let's hear from these authors. Hi, I'm Sarah Lambert. And I'm Joanna Funk. And we're talking, and we're talking about, about our paper, paper Open, Open Educational Education Practices, Practices in a Cultural, cultural Capability Unit, unit learning, learning at the Cultural, at the cultural interface. interface. What's it about? What's it about? Well, well, our motivations, our motivations were, to were to consider the intersection between, between Indigenous-led pedagogy, pedagogy as a particular, as a particular kind, kind of equity pedagogy, pedagogy, pedagogy and, OEPs. and OEPs. We also wanted to broaden the understanding, understanding of how OEP, OEP can be helpful in the design and delivery of higher education units or classes. By a multicultural learning principles. And so, and so we, developed we developed this Australian, Australian University, University case, study case study of curriculum, of curriculum design, design. And there's and three there's data three sets data in there, including, there, including some, some great, student great student quotes, quotes on the use on the of OEPs, OEPs in a first, in a first year, year cultural capability, capability unit, unit at, at Australian, Australian University, University, a classic a kind of foundation unit taken, taken by lots of different, different types of students who are going, going into different discipline areas. So both, so both our study, our study and the unit, unit aligned, aligned on the same, the same uh, concepts, concepts of border, border crossing, crossing, cultural, cultural interface, interface, and, and uh, uh, modeling, modeling and practicing, practicing uh, collaborative, collaborative power, power relations and in, in interactions. And so, and so really the takeaway take message, message why it might, might be interesting, interesting for you is that it's, that it's really useful, useful for universities and educators whose students, students, both local, local and international, come, come from, from a range of different, different socio-linguistic cultural backgrounds, backgrounds and it offers, and it offers a, way a way to help teach and learn across, across multiple, multiple cultures in ways, ways that are respectful and provide, and provide recognition for the strengths of each culture. culture. Um, the um, border the crossings, crossings are also a really good way to frame how did, How did you collaborate with learning, learning in those, those intersecting, intersecting contested um, disciplinary, disciplinary spaces? spaces. And also, and also that, that led to students, students feeling, feeling a lot more agency and actively engaged in learning, learning about, about their own future practices. And so, and so it's, it's for, for all of us, the you know, so, so while, while the unit was designed, designed under Indigenous direction, the concept of border crossings was found useful by all students to navigate across lots of parts of their lives, the disciplinary differences, professional and personal contexts. We also, we also found, found that the OEP design, design in the cultural, cultural interface, interface can enable not only equity, but also emancipation, emancipation from those from limiting, limiting spaces uh, and cultural, cultural dominance, dominance internalized by students, students from, from Indigenous, non-Indigenous, non -Indigenous and international, international backgrounds. So have, so have a look. We, we hope you enjoy and get a lot out of paper. paper. Thanks. Thanks. All right, so that was their project that, that they implemented. And there are so many rich student quotes um, showcasing their experiences and how they found this unit really, really helpful. Um, so I encourage you to go in and read that article. Um, our next one is Verena Roberts. She had to leave, so she wasn't here to join us. But she did create a video of her work. And this is the one with high school students. My name is Dr. Roberts and I completed this research as an educational technology specialist and doctoral student in Alberta, Canada. I am now an educational developer at Concordia University in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. The purpose of this research is, there a need, is, is that there is a need for research that examines how digital networks can support all learners and open access to people, resources, and experiences that were previously inaccessible in K-12 learning contexts. So this study examined the potential of open education theories and open practices in high school learning environments for teachers and students. Using a design-based research approach, this study used the Open Learning Design Intervention Framework, or OLDI framework, to examine the experiences of a researcher, a teacher, and grade 10 students, so 15-year-olds, who expanded their learning from formal to informal learning environments by integrating open educational practices. The key findings suggest that open learning in high school is dependent upon opportunities for learners to co-design personally relevant learning pathways. 
The emerging design framework highlighted the need to emphasize the complexity of students' lived experiences in connection with the curriculum or formal learning environments to promote diversity of perspectives and shared connections in informal learning environments. Secondly, learners needed the opportunity to share their learning experiences collaboratively and individually by transparently demonstrating their learning processes in relevant ways and open practices provided the digital and community spaces to share this knowledge. Finally, open learning occurs through stages and continuums and is a personal learning experience that transcends the boundaries of formal learning environments. The key takeaways of this project is that the magical part of this project was when some of the high school student participants asked if they could put their participation in this research on their resume. They were able to, able to articulate what skills they had learned as a co-designer of the research experience. I also value the fact that I started with less participants than I ended with. After spending, um, <clears throat> after spending time in the classroom, additional students and parents chose to give their consent because they wanted to officially be included in the project. Ensuring that we explained research consent was an essential element of this project from the beginning until the end. As a result, we learned together about digital privacy, research, security, and ethical elements of educational technology and ethical research standards in order to ensure the participants felt safe to learn in all the learning contexts. The biggest surprise was starting in a digital context and ending in, ending in an area of Indigenous knowledge, which was land and human relationship focused. I felt like I had started in the clouds and ended on the earth in a pedagogical journey that I had not previously considered or experienced. I did not expect the final direction of the final project, and I was humbled when the teacher and students asked me to continue for another iteration using design-based research. The final iteration was highly personal for the students, the teacher and myself, and left me with more questions than ever to explore, like equity in assessing open assignments. However, being able to transcend formal and traditional learning boundaries in the name of learning and be a part of shaping the participant and teacher abilities of building confidence in their personal learning journeys was a priceless experience. And in both of these projects, the, the two that we just um, heard from the authors, um, they both incorporated uh, people, shared experiences with people from the community that, that were related to the learning that was going on. Um, and so we're talking about open educational practices, not necessarily connected tightly to OER, but open, open educational practices as in the process of learning. Um, and here's another one. This is the one on social invitation and what, um, what we learned about gender and race-based differences in open invitation. All right, hi all. Um, we are going to talk quickly about our article, Who Writes to Respond, Gender and Race-Based Differences in Open Invitation as a part of the special issue of the Journal for Multicultural Education. Um, my, name my name is Jeff Pfeiffer, I'm part of the team, team that did the research and, and, um, and helped, helped put the paper, paper together, together along with Mario Mockerman, who was Sam Martin, Martin, and then also my colleague Kimberly, Kimberly uh, Lajosser, um, who is also here with me, and we'll talk a little bit about some, some of the findings. findings. So I'm going to just introduce the paper, paper introduce, introduce the project. The project. Um, <laughs> we have been exploring, exploring the use of open annotation software um, like, like Perusal, Perusal and, others and others as a way to think, think about, about issues, issues of systemic justice, justice and um, um, related, related issues, issues in the classroom. classroom. What we know um, from a long uh, history, history of literature on um, anecdotal evidence, evidence is that, that um, in, in a classroom, classroom in discussions um, that are sort of traditionally run, run women and historically minoritized students are often silenced or their voices aren't listened to, um, and uh, an excess of what we call epistemic authority is given to more traditional students in the classroom, epistemic authority being um, the idea that people um, have, have contributions, they have things to say, they have background knowledge that can help. Um, and so, and so we, we were looking, looking at how open annotation software like Perusal can encourage students, students with historically minoritized um, gender and race, race and ethnic identities, identities uh, to share knowledge and ideas and also then help redistribute that, that uh, office of authority in the classroom. What, what we, we found, found in the study, and we'll talk, Kimberly will talk in a few minutes about in more detail about the findings, um, but broadly, 
that, that open education, education tools, tools can help fossil foster more equitable interactions. They're not a cure-all or a total solution, but if you use them in the right way, um, they can contribute to making the classroom more equitable and redistributing that uh, epistemic authority. And I'll let Kimberly talk a little bit about the um, the yeah, yeah, so the, the way, way that we came, came to that conclusion was through distributing a survey at the end of multiple, multiple courses. Um, and, and we found that students reported that open annotations open helped, helped them to do a number of things that we um, presume are really important, important to things, things like epistemic, epistemic authority. So, so they um, found that it helped them to collaborate, to be able to integrate new ideas um, rather than see a new idea and maybe reject it because it doesn't agree with their own thinking. Um, and to really critically analyze sources. Um, we found that women reported that using the open annotation software, so in this case, Perusal, um, helped them to deepen their knowledge and their engagement. So they were engaging more and more deeply. Um, women, um, women of color, color went further, further reporting that, that the, the open annotation process helped, helped to redistribute epistemic authority. So, so a couple of things to think about um, if you use open annotation software in the classroom, sort of some best practices that we've come, come up with, especially if you're thinking about it in this kind of context, um, thinking about you know, distributing more epistemic authority more widely and um, making the classroom discussions more equitable is our, our so a couple of practices that, that, that we think are effective is to certainly bring the annotations uh, and the conversations that happen in the annotation software into the classroom discussions. So I actually use them. I read the annotation discussions before I go into the classroom uh, and I think about how um, what, what is discussed, discussed in the articles, articles by the students as they're reading uh, can help, help frame discussions, discussions we have in the classroom. And I, and I pull out, out, I will pull out comments, comments by students, students and often call on comments, comments by students who are, who are more quiet, quiet in the classroom, classroom, classroom uh, to, sort to sort of, sort of help, help show their, their thinking, thinking and also to help emphasize um, and redistribute some of this epistemic authority, uh, emphasize the ideas of those students who aren't maybe as loud as others. Uh, and, and when, when I, I do this, this I, I see the students light up, up, they get happy, um, and, and then it does this work, work of, of um, helping people distribute that authority. authority. Uh, and, uh, and then, then also, also, if you're, if you're using, using perusal and open annotation as part, part of, of a larger, larger um, open educational um, pedagogy, pedagogy, you can kind of you use, use that, that to talk about the, the usefulness of multiple voices um, and, and open educational resources as, 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 as you know, in, 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 in education process. Um, finally, finally, just to, just to note, note, there's a QR, QR code in the top, top corner, corner of the slide here, here uh, that, that will link directly, directly to the paper, paper if you would like to read more. more. Thanks, Thanks so, much. so much. Which, if you got the first QR code and it's on the last slide as well, um, we'll link you to the entire special issue as well. So I want to engage you guys in discussion. I think we have like four minutes. Yeah. Um, what, think about your own educational context. Think about your role. Um, how do you envision applications like this in your context? I think we were pretty interested in Queens and using for result as well, but we came up against the GDPR chestnut. Yes. So it sounds like a great thing, and I know some academics are kind of using it under their own steam, but as yeah. an institution, we can't do that. Yes. Okay, copyright breach. Oh, copyright? Yeah, yeah. okay. The way, that, that. the way it holds content, so we put a tool, I suppose, it's like agnostic of the tool that we use hypothesis because of that. Yeah. Our institution yeah. uses hypothesis yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. as well. Okay. So there's, there's another. Yeah, there's another. Uh, uh, now, comment is another social yes. annotation tool I've used. I like how comment um, hypothesis can only use text based yes. documents or web pages, whereas now comment, you can put podcasts, you can put videos in there as well um, and, and have students um, socially annotate. Um, it can go public or you can do it in like a private class group only. So um, I found that that's really successful. It doesn't necessarily link so well with learning management systems, but you just take a, the hyperlink, students have to sign up for their account. You, I know. You can't link it with our management system. Anymore. You can't link to anything outside of the management system? We don't have control over our own. Um, it's a problem. <laughs> it's a problem, definitely. Yeah. So. 
Yeah, and when I'm building up my course work, I can put a web link in, and it links to the now comment, and that's that's my workaround with my students. Well, I'll have to look at this. Thank yeah. you. Other thoughts? Learning management systems are so. I don't get this one started. <laughs> Especially if you buy one that is meant to be integrated with things, yes. and then your institution locks it down. And then you can't integrate. Exactly. Mm -hmm. so, sorry. Sorry. Rand over. Yeah. <laughs> yep. There you go. What are you guys thinking? What, what resonated with you in some of these projects that we heard about from the authors? I think there was um, engagement was the thing that came through, mm -hmm. student engagement. Um, since the pandemic, and I'm really glad that this becomes this uh, for your presentation, because we're not talking about what happened in the pandemic, you yes. know, yeah. and it's been the major thing that's happened in everybody's life, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. everybody's been affected by it. And I know certainly in the UK, there's been a lot of talk about how we've got students who are, there's a real problem with engagement, you know, even when they're on campus, yes. we don't see that they're engaged. So I think that's what came through to me about this. It was like, this is a way to get students engaged to, for them to think about their, their own scholarship to empower them. And I think that's really, really positive. To but give them agency. Yeah, exactly. And agent, if, they, if we feel like we are yeah. agents of our own learning, Especially then we're more engaged. Yeah, and to do that in high school or young, you know, or earlier, yeah. that's fantastic. But again, in universities, when we get to tertiary education, yeah. and we have all these other things that shut that down. Yeah, yeah. Well, in K-12 systems, we do as yes, well. Yes, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's even harder, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And then you've got the parents that are also yeah. like, I don't want my child's information out there. OK, that's fine. <laughs> so you run into even different kinds of roadblocks. Yeah. yeah. Other thoughts? Stuff about the, the indigenous peoples is obviously a thing that's been popping up for a while, quite rightly. But it, it always stuck to me raises this question the, the, the blowback to, to the people who weren't the indigenous peoples and how did they get them? Um, how did it come about? It's taken a couple of hundred years to suddenly discover indigenous peoples and do yeah. something about it, you know. Uh, so I think there's a whole set of challenges there. It's, it's not quite reparations in, in one sense, but in some ways it is. It's kind of repairing. The uh, psychological, cultural damage mm -hmm. that the oppressors have done themselves. In some ways, we say, "Well, yeah, but they, they got the big houses and the cars, so let's not cry too much about them." But it is there, and I think it, it can must express itself in quite awful ways. And we can see uh, how through each of these projects, yeah. students become more aware, exactly. just aware. They exactly. see other perspectives that maybe they wouldn't see if it were if they weren't engaged in some of these um, all right, so I encourage you, check out the special issue. Stacey and I also recorded a podcast episode. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. One of our next steps is we are thinking about expanding this into a handbook of open educational practices. Um, and we want it to be international in scope. So that's something that we are thinking about. Um, and yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Perfect timing. Timing. Yeah. Yeah. And Thanks. Keith is here with us now as well. <laughs> so Keith, I'm sorry, you're not going to get a break. <laughs> um, we'll hand it over right to um, Bill, Sheila and um, Keith for their presentation with a very long title. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, you've already done the program. Yeah. We've got the clicker if somebody wants to take, um, right. just click down. Okay. okay, so the big title was just so we're kind of pretending to be academic. So we're really glad to be here. Thank you all for coming at this late stage in the conference. Um, we might ask you to you know, participate and please feel free to interrupt because we might not have prepared as much as we should have. <laughs> but um, we're just going to share some of the work we've been doing over the last couple of years um, around open education and around commissions of curriculum and openness. And actually the OER conference itself has been really pivotal for our research because what we've been doing is our work has really been a discursive construct, hasn't it? And we have taken drafts of our work to OER conferences and we've had feedback from the community and that's been really, really important in how things have developed. 
and I'm going to move to the next uh, slide. This is just what we're going to do, quick overview, we can do that. Again, just kind of leading on from what we were talking about. Um, this work, our original work was done in the before times, before the pandemic, um, and we have this model of the digitally distributed curriculum, um, and we've been looking at it, we're looking at it again during the pandemic, and it seemed to stand that up, um, but now we want to review it and we want to kind of build on it, and we want to get your feedback on how relevant we think this is now in the now times, um, and we want to see if we can develop this further as an open artifact and a lens of um, a conceptual lens on thinking about curriculum issues and what we're doing in openness and the role of openness and um, open educational uh, resources but probably more importantly open educational practice um, in curriculum and learning design um, so I'm going to hand over it to Bill now. I think so. Well we have in the background the big purple blob there if you can't see it is the <laughs> colour of the book because it came out of some of our uh, discursive constructivism uh, some years back, but pre-COVID. Uh, and it's one of the themes that we'll bring up and maybe you can help us with this is, is the work we were doing then still as relevant uh, as it was uh, and has it gained new relevance. But uh, the way we worked as discursive practitioners was very often to go down to the Black Owl Bar <laughs> and have a pizza and a glass of wine and try and reassemble the, the work we've done in writing retreats up here very often. Uh, and so uh, it's, uh, I guess the pandemic's given us time for reflection, as you might say. And I've talked to a number of people about it, and the folk are reporting all sorts of very odd senses of time, how it's affected their sense of themselves in time, their pasts and their futures. There's a lot of stuff there, I think, to be in mind. There was a thing called the post-pandemic university on the go for a year or two. And early on in the pandemic, a lot of people put in uh, experiences like, I can't do anything. I'm trying to teach online and I just can't do it. And it's not because uh, I lack skills. Uh, something's happened existentially that is interfering with my ability to, uh, to engage. So the book itself, uh, we started out with the idea of the digital university. And there was a lot of stuff about tsunamis of technology at that time, which we didn't really fancy very much. We need to, <laughs> the uh, stance we took was to step back a bit and say, well, what is the university anyway? And we had a couple of uh, uh, themes there. One was the university is actually better called the neoliberal university these days, because you can uh, conceptualize it everything that really was on in the university, certainly in the UK and in other parts of the world, has been part of the neoliberal uh, capture of public policy and the economy and the people's lives. So that was our starting point. Uh, and we also, you know, kind of thought in terms of constructs more like curriculum and course design. So those are big constructs for us, and we'll say a lot more about that in uh, the next week part of the, the presentation. Uh, and I think also we had quite distinct views ourselves about what pedagogy might be, what it might entail. We were quite influenced, well influenced by Paolo Freire, who obviously kind of best known to people for the pedagogy of the oppressed, which I was thinking about in terms of your talk, that that was very pertinent to it. And we thought it also pertinent to us, not so much for the attack on the banking system of education, as he called it, but more the idea of the development of critical consciousness uh, and his work with the kind of broad title, Education for Critical Consciousness. So we thought a lot about what is higher education for critical consciousness, what would go on. Uh, and a lot of the things I've heard through the conference the last couple of days are people saying, well, you really have to challenge students who think they're coming here to learn discrete bits of engineering or, or chunks of law. Uh, and that fact base will see them for the rest of their lives, which, if you put it together with a neoliberal political policy for education, the government is saying to people, the real value of education comes five years after you've graduated, and it can be counted, if you like, in terms of your salary then. And if you're not earning enough, then you've screwed up. You've spent five, four to five years at university, and you're not earning nearly as much as you ought to. And that, obviously, I think uh, you can just pick that apart in so many ways. And a lot of what I've heard over the last few days has done just that. But to wind up and pass on to Keith, one of the main constructs we got out from that work was the idea of a digitally distributed curriculum. And that's really what we want to focus on this afternoon. 
get some feedback on it from yourselves and possibly start thinking, how does this fit in the post-pandemic landscape? Uh, is it still relevant? Can it be changed? What are the values that we espouse at, at OER that are relevant to, to that model? So I think, please, I'm not sure if you've been told, but you're next. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I need to remember not another presentation anymore. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I think as Bill, uh, she would have alluded to, we, we kind of framed our work, you know, around the concept of the digital university and, and the, 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 you know, the harnessing of the digital within the university. But actually what we're really talking about, and we really explored, that was the lens. We we're kind of looking at what's the purpose of universities? What should, the, should be the purpose? And what's the role of the digital and open education practice in extending higher education and the work of universities as a public good. And not just for those who could benefit from formally participating in higher education, but from the wider kind of beneficiaries uh, in our communities, anyone who could benefit from the activities of learning and teaching within universities and what that produces. And that's where we kind of focus the analysis, the idea of the digitally distributed curriculum. This could probably say the digitally distributed university. We could probably say digi digi digitally distributed learning and teaching. But we focus on the curriculum Partly because we felt that was kind of a pragmatic response. Our educators all deal with the curriculum in some form or another. So those of us that support learning and teaching all deal with the curriculum and the programs of study in some form or another. But we also want to challenge what is this notion of the curriculum you know, um, and challenge things like um, the notion of the curriculum as a syllabus, a body of knowledge to be taught, or even more de developmental things like you know, the curriculum as a, a, a kind of journey that supports personal and professional development. We were interested in the curriculum as a space and a cone space, a co-constructed space, and a space that could be located and dislocated um, as was appropriate. So in relation to the, I might just move up here, that's all right, see a little bit better. The digitally distributed curriculum, we, we um, sorry, I'm just sure. <laughs> sorry. It's okay, I'll, I'll sorry. stop it out. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't propose to go through all of this, but we, we can conceptualize this as being based around um, the core values of praxis, public pedagogy and participation. Uh, our notion of praxis is drawn directly from Freire's notion of praxis in an educational context, about challenging and changing the structures and the beliefs that need to be challenged and changed, both in relation to what was taught, but both in relation, uh, also in relation to how, and for our purposes, the curriculum can be a conduit or a cone space that can benefit everyone, um, not just those who are formally engaged in teaching or formally engaged in learning. So we have these core values around um, praxis, public pedagogy and participation. Public pedagogy, this, this notion that um, we should be as open as possible um, in our engagement around learning and teaching. Um, and that goes two ways. Um, it goes from us outwards and it goes from outside inwards. Um, and participation, just as a core value around all who should be participating, should be supported to participate, both in activities of the university, but also in relation to things like the curriculum. So then we have um, what we call enabling dimensions. Maybe kind of like the pillars that support the practice. Um, so we frame these around open scholarship, co-production, co-location, and porosity. Um, we were never quite sure if porosity or leakiness was the right word, but this notion that things that we do here can go out and things that are out there can come in and they can all mesh together and create something much better for everyone. And then the kind of third element, instantiation and enactment of the digitally distributed curriculum, they were really the practices. Um, and we go into this in a lot more detail in the book and our other work, obviously, but the things that you'd actually do to make all of this happen. So thinking about, for example, in relation to porosity, open textbooks and resources, and then kind of open textbooks as kind of social justice, um, and not, not just limiting open to the more recent discussions that, that kind of infer open online and open digital, but open on campus, open in the community, and how that's supported by fluid curricular models um, where they're not necessarily time limited, and you can come in and go out at points in time that, that suit you and are important to you. In terms of co-location, thinking about the designed physical and digital spaces, but also thinking about self-selected digital spaces and informal spaces and public and digital third spaces um, uh, that, that can be occupied um, to do something meaningful in terms of learning and teaching. 
And then um, just to pull out another couple of little things um, in terms of kind of core production, um, looking at how we negotiate what should be in the curriculum and what should be produced through the curriculum and what else it should all look and feel like. Um, and in terms of open scholarship, thinking about things like digital artifacts, um, you know, the extent to which the outcomes of learning and teaching could be digital artifacts and be shared beyond the walls of the institution have a wider kind of public value, whether it's like a documentary or a digital social issue report, whatever it might be. Um, and importantly in this context, also student digital scholarship, tied to the notion of digital artifacts, but this, this idea that um, scholarship and digital scholarship should be as much for our students as for ourselves, and they're generating knowledge that can be shared and should be shared. So that's where we kind of came to with the digitally distributed curriculum. We, we got a fair bit of traction with this idea, but then we found during lockdown, um, we found ourselves engaging or being engaged to explore in a lot more detail in terms of implications. And I think Sheila's going to cover how we've evolved this slightly. Yeah, so yeah, thanks, Keith. So yeah, I think what we found during the, the lockdown that actually our values of practice, participation, and public pedagogy actually were really came to the fore during the lockdown. Um, because people were participating. There was a huge amount of public pedagogy during the pandemic. The government was sharing data every day with us. I don't know how it was in other parts of the world, but certainly in the UK, I had a few data literacy issues with some of the slides that were being shown because I had no idea what they were all about. But you know, they were very difficult, very small things. But you know, people were talking about things. People suddenly understood a lot more about infectious diseases than they ever had before. We were talking about transmission. We were talking about, you know, our language changed as well. You know, isolation. We were talking about, you know, so it did have an, a, an impact. So um, definitely, we thought that was there, and also our enabling dimensions. Again, we felt that that those notions of co-location, porosity, and co-production. Really not true. I think in terms of co-location, that was really an interesting one. I think it's Keith that came up with this really neat, neat phrase, but during the pandemic, we were all dislocated. We were dislocated from our campuses, we were dislocated from our, each other, but we were co-located again through digital technology and through our spaces. So that idea of co-location actually took on greater meaning, I think, in the pandemic and has done since, although it's changed. And I think something we've noticed is that the ideas of kind of hybrid and high flex, kind of co-location, but it's not really. And it seems again to go back to some of our original research, very much centered in this kind of technocentric view of, of the world that we will buy the hybrid solution. So we're probably in what is technically a hybrid teaching room. Actually, if you're co-locating people, people are coming in and there are people here. That's a really difficult thing to manage and to design for. So it's not enough just to have the technology. There's a lot more that we need to think about, not just for teaching, but also for our students, how they engage in these spaces, engage with each other effectively. So um, the things I've put in, in purple here are things I think that have changed. So I think what we're looking at is how we design for in-person and for uh, digital or online learning spaces. I think we have to rethink how we're doing that to make it equitable. Um, we've still got these self-selective digital uh, um, and learning spaces, but I think students have much more choice and expect more choice and flexibility about where and when they are going to be in person or on campus. There's an expectation that, that's changed. I think as well as a fluid curriculum that we talked about, that kind of leans on to this notion of a fluid campus, because where is the campus? What is the campus? Um, I think someone showed the Edinburgh, at least Kate, you showed it, the Edinburgh Manifesto for Online Teaching. We are the campus. We are, exactly. We all became the campus during lockdown. We've all got that residual memory of it. So we need to think about that as well. I think in terms of this co-production, I think negotiation and agency always really important. Evolving digital capabilities, yes. I think now again, moving back, this kind of choice of modes of participation and spaces and devices is something we really need to think about. And this moves on, and I think that ties in really nicely with what we were talking about earlier. We need to be thinking about equitable and inclusive and sustainable pedagogies so that everything we're doing enables people to um, have that experience. So again, one of the things I think particularly for you know those privileged people um, in the global north, 
suddenly it became clear in lockdown that actually not everyone had access to things and it became clear to people in a way that it hadn't before so you know i don't know how many stories were told about you know students trying to write a dissertation kind of on a mobile phone because they didn't have a laptop at home they didn't have connectivity they would kind of forgotten those things those issues are still there um so how do we now think about our curriculum to make things more equitable um, and you know not forget about the experiences but talk about them and learn from our students as well so how can we manage that that tension be between students wanting more flexibility about us saying maybe hey, we can do hybrid education not really actually understanding what it is and you know our first keynote yesterday i think that blew the lid on what <laughs> hybrid would be because we're having a very binary discussion just now about what you know what the, the choices are so we want to we want to look at that and we think that this is really important to start looking from that and not forget about things but actually work with our students to say okay what does it mean to you when you are off campus and you are here how can we make you, your experience as engaging as possible or as meaningful as possible for you as a learner so these are the kind of things that we've been looking at but again this is just a starting point and it is quite a complex diagram <laughs> but we'd love feedback on it <laughs> so and if there's a way that you think we could make it a bit similar but um it's also quite good at conference because it makes us make really into that job <laughs> take the title and you take that and you get a phd yeah. <laughs> um, but there are some other questions that um just uh, we'd like we thought that might be worth just having a conversation with in terms of openness and it has been discussed through the conference at the conference what how much is the role of openness actually acknowledged in current approaches to curriculum and, and learning design? Um, now it's quite interesting. I did a, was involved in a survey last year uh, for this, where we surveyed um, UK in, in higher education institutions on their approaches to curriculum and learning design, uh, just to see if anything had changed during the pandemic. One of the most surprising uh, findings for that for me was that 63% of respondents said that they shared learning curriculum designs openly. So there's a huge amount of sharing about the process. It's actually kind of what you were talking about that, you know, we have these models, we'll share that. I think during the pandemic, again, there was a huge amount of sharing about open sharing because people had got a lot of resources that they were able, you could pick them up really easily. And I think there's a lot of modeling behavior by people like probably a lot of the people in this room, by educational developers, by uh, lecturers and teachers, educators in general, people are sharing. Um, but should there be a, a requirement to, to utilise OERs in, in when you're designing things? Would that be another way to kind of get openness more there? Um, I don't know, Keith, do you want to take over and feel that or, or put you on the spot or I just keep going? No, 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 I, I, you know, I think these, I think, you know, keep going, sure. yeah. I think we saw these all as a, yeah. a continuum of maybe a yeah. increasingly sophisticated, sophisticated questions we might ask ourselves. Yes. How we embed this? Yeah. So, at your institution, you know, how, how can we get commitments to openness and to sharing within it? And I know, again, Leo Haverman, he's doing work in that. Um, but, you know, when we talk about, are we really opening things up? And going back to that notion of, of public um, pedagogy and what we were talking about, you know, about the kind of fluid curriculum. How are we working with our community? And I think um, Anna Wendy, uh, she illustrated that beautifully yesterday afternoon in her presentation and she was showing how her students were working you know they were dislocated co-located they were working in the community they were working with the community they were opening up what they were doing so again that was a beautiful instantiation if you like the digitally distributed curriculum but how can we move that forward into other disciplines what does that actually mean what how can you be open within you know the architecture community, how can we be open within French, within that open sciences, which I can't think Sheila, an interesting point, and I wonder if you can confirm this with me at CUNY, because this is something I heard, like, when the pandemic hit, the City University of New York got, like, money earmarked for OER, right? Is that it? And then... CUNY has speaking. had yeah. money earmarked right. for OER. The state of New York has initiatives yeah. out there focused on higher ed um, for 
um, incentivizing faculty to utilize OER to create OER. Um, and and the, the push is really to use OER, um, especially as within New York City, and um, I teach in the Bronx, one of the colleges yeah. in the Bronx, which is one of the um, most marginalized communities in the country. Um, and so, yeah, there's a, there's a huge push to let's give our, our students can't afford these textbooks and so they don't buy them, so let's use OER. Um, and do they do they put a requirement up? There is no requirement that you're incentivized. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, I think it comes back to though intentionality, and in each of the manuscripts or the articles in the special issue, you can see that intentionality. Each of these projects had the the teachers, the educators that were part of them, really intentionally designed learning experiences. They wanted to choose OER for their courses, or they wanted to utilize these practices to foster student agency. Yeah. And without that intentionality, and I can see the intentionality in your diagram, mm -hmm. right? You're really thinking about what is campus? Yeah. Like, yeah. You, you know, you're, you're thinking about all of these aspects of curriculum design, learning design, how people are accessing materials. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now, just, uh, some of the trouble money and uh, get the pandemic, uh, the Irish government gave uh, mm -hmm. the universities money for uh, to keep laptops and disadvantaged students. Sounds great. 22% of the county I live in, that's no good broadband. So here's a free laptop. Right. But the yeah. stuff you're doing, <laughs> you know, I wouldn't use that as a doorstop. Well, when it comes to like, the UK and mainland to, with the free laptops, uh, and there was a quick slurge, I and mean, that's the last you heard of it until somebody said only 20% of the kids have actually got them, but they haven't been delivered yet. Basically, the pandemic is over by the time we're getting them to deliver them. So yeah, the point is that other, as I mentioned as well, it's really important that they came, sorry, came to the fore during the pandemic as well. But um, even if you're technology rich in your own home environment, it might be space poor. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just a significant challenge. Yeah. yeah yeah, I think this is a fantastic, fantastic question that I think it's my minority. Um, and I think there's a question, for me it's a big question in curriculum design, for example, the question of openness, the first one that you have there. Uh, because when, or my approach to curriculum design is like teachers know where to lead the class, for example. How open is that to collaboration and interaction with students? And it has many layers and nuances, for example, if the curriculum is bought to a distributor, uh, how open is that? In Colombian case, it's like really determined that way. And the second question that I take for myself is in context where there is no internet, how, yeah. how can the digital and the fluidity and that place take place? For example, how can we design for offline context or mobile first? Uh, so it can respond to these. Uh, I think one thing that strikes me about it, sometimes it's helpful to me, anyone anyway, with my kind of limited brain power is just to look at the opposite side. Say, what's the opposite to this look like? And in Britain, it looks like Eton, Oxford, Cambridge, and etc. We have a very closed elite uh, gold standard higher education in this country and many others. Uh, and I, I'd be very interested to know how many people in Eton, Oxford, etc. how many conversations like this. I'd suspect not many. <laughs> And why would they? They get a lot of money, it costs a lot of money to send your kids there, but they're on the royal road to not just uh, good graduate earnings five years down the line to be prime minister or some bloody thing like that. And, uh, and I, I think that's perhaps a, a thing I'd like to see explored a bit more. And it would raise this whole idea of class consciousness and the nature of society, culture, politics, and in relation to education. Because if you don't, when you stop and these stand amongst ourselves, the Etonians, uh, the old Harrovians, the Oxbridge crowd will just sail on, uh, staying at the top of the tree. They are the people who will fill the leaders in media, politics, business, yeah. etc. So it is a, a big one, I think. You know. And I think following on from that, um, I don't know how it was in, in other countries. I think there was a bit of this in, in Ireland as well. Um, but after, between the kind of First lockdown and the second lockdown, then there was this. Well, during the middle of the lockdown, there was this overriding narrative that online was secondary. It was yeah, a bad yeah, experience. Yeah. We had to get back on campus. Yeah. Um, so and you know, exams. proper exams. Yeah. So there was a, a brief moment of hope when people were. There was a huge amount of shame. Maybe people were yeah. saying we're all yeah. zooming all the time. Yeah. And yeah. how do you do this? And it was great. It was a collective thing. It's, and that was horrendous. But 
at the same time that kind of kept people going. That's been shut down. There was a point where universities were actually being a bit more confident about actually maybe we could change things. Maybe we could really think about how we have a bit more of a how we're using spaces, when people are going to be on and off campus, how we can really allow people to have a bit more choice. And then it got shut down, it got shut down. And you know, if the government are running things, um, you know, they, they pay. So, you know, people have to do that. But also I think there was a big, big um, yeah, it, it highlighted that issue that a lot of people in power did not understand what contemporary university education, or even not in anything, what, what it was like, but particularly for university, because the majority of them have gone through that very traditional, you go to university, you go to a lecture, even if you look at, even now when you do a search on Google for a university, what's the first thing that comes in? It's an electrical. Yeah. Yeah. So even before the pandemic, there was a lot of amazing work going on with people doing things. People had got rid of lectures, there was a lot of interaction, there were lots of things going on, but the narrative didn't carry through. Um, and again, I think that's one of the things that we as an open education community suffer from as well, because people don't really understand, it's not quite gone into that, that narrative. So as we're moving forward, how can we think about how we can do that? And how can we trust ourselves and how can we uh, make our university management trust us and our students to make these changes as well? But it's done, as I said, a wee bit that uh, for the pandemic, people seem to think pandemic will be over in two minutes. Yeah. But in reality, the pandemic went on for a few years. I took a whole cohort of university students in England and put them through the degree course and the amount of time that they were you were trapped in this kind of pandemic, pan-dimensional place where they might have a phone or they might have a computer or whatever. And if we'd been in charge, we could just have said to them, we will change the first year experience, we will roll that through to the end of the degree course. And by the time we've done that, we'll have proofed a concept of open education, for example. We don't have very much time left now, so we can carry on the discussion, but we have got a little padlet board, so if you want to take a photograph of the QR code and you want to share anything with it, that would probably be useful, but you know, we can use... Are there any other comments or questions? Yeah, I think we have to be careful, though, of like, anytime you mandate something, like yeah. your question, do we should yeah. mandate that? Yeah, we yeah. yeah. Should be, yeah. Then, you know, the, it causes other issues Absolutely. as well, yeah, especially for equity, and so yeah, that's something exactly. to like be mindful of. And I think that's part of the intention. Of yeah, absolutely. And again, the point of that there, you know, people who can't get connected. Right. You know, mm -hmm. that's a, that's still a huge issue. And I, I can we one other issue that I can see particularly with our institution is even if we get access to open resources and there's more development of it, is the tools that are used, particularly around GDPR and our institution is terrible for locking down things. Yeah. Yeah. It's finding replacements yeah. and putting in that extra work and maybe yeah, getting to a point actually where yeah, those open resources are actually usable as they are because we don't have to worry about GDPR and, and privacy yeah. and all that anymore, but I don't think... Yeah. Well, I don't we're know if that we're free. <laughs> 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 We've taken back control of... Uh, well, Computer system. <laughs> <laughs> and also Boris Johnson. And <laughs> Boris Johnson saved the country because they learned how to use PowerPoint and TV. <laughs> <laughs> well, next slide, next <laughs> We're also really keen, uh, if folk are willing, uh, wanting to continue this discussion, uh, to hear from you. Um, uh, we're looking at a next stage in the work we've been doing, and um, probably taking the form of some sort of like you know co-created kind of publication or selection of case studies about some of this stuff. Um, so we'll have more to share on that due course, but if anyone might be interested in having a discussion about that, please do get in touch with us. And it does, it will involve the Black Hill Barn. <laughs> really confident of that. Your are Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you to all the presenters, and I think we have like 15 minutes now right before we head back to the lecture theatre for the preliminary discussion. The wrap-up, yes. The wrap-up. Thank you. 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 Thank